Dear Filippo, on behalf of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy at the University of Cambridge, uh, thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me on the global humanitarian situation uh, and the opportunity, of course, that exists for philanthropists in the emerging markets and elsewhere to engage in addressing these challenges. Filippo Grandi is uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, heading up the uh, phenomenally important and critical work of the UNHCR, uh, and has been uh, immersed in humanitarian uh, and refugee issues for more than three decades, uh, including previously serving as the Commissioner General of uh, UNRWA, uh, which of course is the UN agency dedicated to uh, the well-being of uh, Palestinian uh, refugees. Mr. Grandi is also um, has a lot of uh, first-hand experience in uh, the emerging markets, having worked with the UN and with uh, other NGOs in Africa, Asia, uh, and the Middle East uh, at various points in his uh, remarkable uh, career. Dear Filippo, uh, if I may, uh, can you first give us a sense of the state of the current humanitarian sector in terms of global needs and the shortfalls in funding, as well as the impact of COVID-19 on the sector and the world's most vulnerable. Thank you very much, Bader. Thank you very much, first of all, for this and all the rest that you yourself do to help uh, um, to boost philanthropy. I believe this is an incredibly worthwhile effort. Uh, first of all, because to reply to your questions, clearly we're not meeting all the needs, the basic humanitarian needs that we in the humanitarian community assess every year. There's many humanitarian crises. My organization deals with refugees, with displaced people, with stateless people, but then there are other humanitarian problems, hunger, um, uh, issues affecting children, um, um, uh, humanitarian problems generated by the climate emergency, you name it. Unfortunately, with the uh, lasting conflicts, conflicts that never get resolved, and with the multiplication of global uh, problems like climate change, um, poverty and inequality, and now, in addition to all that, in the last few months, a huge global pandemic, uh, unfortunately, the, the spiraling of the needs is not matched by an equal amount of resources pledged. Now, let's make no mistakes. Uh, human, the humanitarian community mobilizes billions every year. And this has been growing steadily over the years, both from the public sector, this is still the majority of funding from governments, voluntary funding, let's remember, most of the humanitarian work is not subjected to quotas like peacekeeping or political work of the UN. This is voluntary. States can decide one year to give us money and the next year not to give us money for a certain activity. But uh, we have seen a growing, growing contributions also from other sources, including private philanthropy. And I think this is good. Let me give you an example translating it um, in UNHCR terms, in the terms of my organization. We have uh, a yearly budget. That means the totality of needs for 80 million refugees and displaced people and up to 10 million stateless people is about between eight and $9 billion in the last few years. We uh, collect about half of that between 50 and 60% when we're lucky. Now of that, about 12, 13% is from either individuals, companies, foundations, non-government sources, essentially private philanthropy in a very broad sense. So we've, we've reached, this year we will reach for the first time half a billion dollars in this type of contributions. This is interesting because it is still little compared to the public uh, contributions. But if I think of when I was a much younger official in UNHCR, uh, 15, 20 years ago, we were lucky if we collected $20 million from private sources. So it has really multiplied and this is very positive. But 
much more needs to be done to meet the totality of needs. And in the three decades that you've been deeply engaged in the sector, how has uh, private philanthropy and humanitarian causes evolved over time? You mentioned, of course, that there has been an uptick, but how can we improve the nature of this engagement going forward? You know, I'm always perplexed that the funding gap exists in the first place. The fact that many hundreds of billions, if not trillions of philanthropic capital is dispersed every year. Uh, in addition to, of course, the large amounts of government aid, as you mentioned, and increasingly socially conscious business community. So between all these sectors, we're still unable to come up with the few billion dollars to plug the gap to help the world's most vulnerable children uh, women and uh, and men. So so what's going on? Well, and I have to add to your concern because uh, this is not uh, to 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 boast, but UNHCR's funding results, in average, are on the high side compared to other organizations or compared to the totality of needs. So uh, the point that you raise is very relevant. I want to uh, to make a point. Well, first of all. Uh, let's let me put it this way. We're talking about big figures here, so it is difficult to meet uh, these targets. On the other hand, you know, I'm not an economist, but I think the total GDP of the world is what in the tens of trillions. So we're talking about a very tiny percentage of the world's resources, right? So uh, I think uh, that more can be done, but. I do appreciate that there is a certain fatigue, partly because these crises, they do not simply get resolved with money. Money serves the immediate needs, the immediate consequences of conflict or climate change. But what needs to be done is address the root causes and there we are failing. Let's face it, we are failing and that is not encouraging to philanthropy. Philanthropy needs to see a way forward. So my appeal to philanthropists is, you know, help us in that direction. I want, you know, to answer your question, I want to say something that for me is fundamental, which I have really understood much better uh, in the last few years. In the past, we humanitarians would go to philanthropic donors and say, please give us money. You know, it was essentially a charity gesture, which is very noble. I'm not suggesting otherwise, and it's very generous. Solidarity is still the foundation of humanitarian work. So I'm not dismissing that. But for many uh, philanthropic partners, that's the key word. They want to be real partners. They just don't want, they just, they don't want to just give money. They want to be partner in making progress making interventions more sustainable and who knows even moving towards solution we've made incredible progress there with a number especially in the private sector with a number of partners that partner with us and say okay we'll give you 10 million dollars but let's work together towards for example a better business model or for example uh, let's choose what investments to make so that we can also reassure our own stakeholders that the money that we give you is not simply a nice donation, but contributes to solve problems, to give an opportunity to the beneficiaries of this project, to move towards a solution of their plight. I think that moving from pure charity, and again, Bader, I, I would never allow myself to criticize pure charity. I think it has an important value fundamental but moving from just that to real partnership between public organizations like mine and many others and the private sector is what we have understood and there's so much so much that philanthropists can do to help us improve the way we work i think that's an incredibly important point that you make and i might just add that you can still at least in my view you can still have pure altruistic selfless charity while still um, embedding the discipline around ensuring that there is a return on that investment. Of course, not a financial return, but a social return and expecting the same sort of rigor uh, and transparency and accountability associated with that investment as you would in a pure financial investment. So I don't think there is a necessarily a trade-off between one and the other. Um, but turning to, um, uh, I guess, the emerging 
uh, markets. Um, the top 30 fastest growing economies of the world last year were all in emerging markets. Uh, a lot of wealth is being generated and transitioned within these regions of the world. And as a result, a new generation of strategic philanthropists is beginning to emerge across uh, Africa, the Middle East, and developing Asia. Of course, the nature of humanitarian crises uh, has also changed significantly in the past few decades. And, and through my, um, I guess, exposure through the sector as a member of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on humanitarian financing, I learned of the key, of the, of the trend towards human conflict, uh, towards root cause, and also the significantly longer-term nature of crises, as you mentioned. So how can organizations like the UNHCR help this rising community of philanthropists navigate some of these complexities, especially when some or many might be reticent to engage in situations of human conflict or where they may not see more immediate resolutions? I can give you so many examples, but let me think of a few. Um, first of all, and I fully agree with your point that there is no contrast between altruism and strategic partnership. You know, they're both part of the same, uh, uh, of the same cooperation. Look, let's take a very big humanitarian crisis, which keep, keeps us busy all the time. The Rohingya refugee crisis, uh, Rohingya refugees from Myanmar that fled to Bangladesh especially in 2017, almost a million people there in a very poor area of Bangladesh, really depending a lot on humanitarian assistance. Now, who were the first responders? I remember visiting there just after the exodus. It was terrible, you know, the trauma, the pain, the suffering, the difficult conditions. We were thinking, oh my God, how are we going to be able to address this? Yet, you know who were the first local responders? The local, the local community, first of all, and then local people with a little bit of money that felt compassion for these people just coming from the other side of the borders and help. Now, I think that this happens in so many humanitarian crises. This is the first, <laughs> the first uh, uh, um, philanthropy, right? almost community to community. Now, we are trying in many places to evolve that into sensitizing the local business community. And uh, in all these countries, there is a thriving business community that can do a lot to help. I'll give you another anecdote. Uh, the Venezuela crisis, you know, lots of Venezuelans fleeing to neighboring countries. Big humanitarian problem. Uh, I went to Brazil a few years back. I organized a meeting, we organized a meeting with the very important business community in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And my people told me, you know, we need to get them to understand the global uh, mechanism of philanthropy. When I spoke to them, they said, okay, we'll learn about that. But first tell us, what can we do here in Brazil for the Venezuelans? We see them here, can we employ them? Can we give you money for them to, for you to help them? Can we help local NGOs? Can we partner with the government in their effort? So, you know, I understood that the starting point is perhaps working with local business communities on situations that they understand with much immediacy and perhaps even better than us. And for which they have a lot of opportunities, not just money, like I said, but other forms of helping, employment, this is maybe not the case with the Rohingya, which is complex, but it is the case in many other refugee situation. Uh, employing people is as valuable as giving money, of course, because you give them a more sustainable uh, form of support. So I think that there is a lot that can be done. Then, of course, um, the last point, and this is the point you're making essentially, can we, um, can we be ambitious? and bring the private sector, the philanthropist in uh, emerging uh, economies, can we bring them to the global scene? And I think that the answer is yes. So I started from really the community level, moved to business communities that may be interested in local humanitarian issues. The third stage is to uh, help them um, step up to the global scene. 
And frankly, we see a lot of that happening already. Uh, we see this in Gulf countries clearly, where the outlook is more global than in other places for obvious reasons. And we see it in many other places. I remember a trip to South Africa and meeting uh, representatives from uh, the business community in, uh, in, in Johannesburg. That was quite amazing because they really made the point very strongly. They told me, look, you tell us how it works, uh, the humanitarian dynamics. We tell you what to do in Africa. We know it better than you. And it was so true. And they had such great ideas. So really, this marriage between global and local is where there is a great space for uh, philanthropy in emerging economies, which I think is the, the potential for the future. Thank you. And exactly, I, you know, the, I think the, the trend towards engaging uh, local actors uh, more authentically, I think, is not just a, an exciting one, but an extremely important one. One of the key uh, trends, I guess, being encouraged within philanthropy that's also in line with the principles of strategic philanthropy is uh, collaborative uh, models that achieve a multiplier effect on impact. Of course, competition does also have its benefits uh, in certain circumstances, helping to reduce uh, inefficiencies and enhance uh, value propositions. How would you rate the current state of collaboration within the humanitarian sector? And is there such a thing as health healthy competition when it comes to this sort of critical work? I think there, there is no doubt. Um, I think that... Uh, Let's uh, face it, and I think that this is actually a very healthy aspect of this whole issue, that for the private sector, for businesses, um, fulfilling their social, an element of social responsibility is, um, is a positive badge, right? That, uh, that improves their standing their image whilst doing a good thing. So why not? I am very pragmatic in this man. You know, we know, how, you know business is business. It has to work according in a competitive market. So if, if, if this allows them to look better than another company, why not? I will certainly then go to the other company and tell them so that, uh, you know, to stimulate this healthy competition. Um, we, we need, of course, to remain in, the, in a certain ethical sphere. We need to, you know, we, we are also always conducting due diligence on companies to make sure that their practices do not contravene the fundamental ethics of, of uh, uh, humanitarian work, et cetera, et cetera. But given those parameters, I think competition is good. And how do I rate that partnership? Let me go back to my point. Partnership actually is the key word as opposed to simply giving, but you know, working together. And there is, I think, where we need to really explore even further. What can businesses do in this area that is useful? And there's so many areas and so many fields in which we can work, we do work together already. Think of technology, for example, where businesses have a big added value and a lot of uh, knowledge to share with us using technology in an appropriate way. We have, for example, we have a great project with Vodafone in Africa to improve connectivity in remote schools that host refugees. And we do it in a number of countries and it's very successful and we're expanding it further. We work with IKEA uh, in, um, in, uh, in Ethiopia. I visited uh, 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 a while ago a fantastic community development project where both refugees and local people work together on sustainable energy, on uh, uh, economic self-reliance, on agricultural projects, but also on education and health. Really, it's a, an all-encompassing project that you know the government has noticed it and is using it as a model for other areas. And this is because uh, IKEA or the IKEA Foundation for IKEA came not only with money, but with a different business model, uh, translated from the private sector into the public sector. And we learned a lot from them 
and we improved very much what we were doing earlier with more traditional models. So you see also this is an important area of, of partnership. I mentioned employment. You know, um, we work with uh, uh, um, companies in Asia, for example, that have agreed to employ in each country where they are a small quota of refugees if that country hosts refugees. I can give you so many examples. So I think that this is the way to go is resources, of course, because also these partnerships do require resources, but it is also the models, the new approaches. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about new financing model, very sophisticated. I'm not a big expert in that. I am much more keen, I have to be honest, on practical areas of cooperation that we need to continue to develop. And last point, we are very open to suggestions. You know, we may not have all the answers. We do not have all the answers. We, we, we've often listened to a proposal coming from a business or, an, or a rich individual, a philanthropist that wants to use his or her money with new approaches. We've adopted that and made great progress. Thank you so much, uh, dear Filippo, really, once again, for sharing uh, your great uh, insights and your energy and your, and your passion for what you do with us, which really shines through and through, through, through the way in which you speak, but also, of course, all your actions. And thank you for speaking to us, despite the fact that you yourself are recovering from uh, COVID-19. Of course, wish you a very speedy recovery uh, and hope to have the great pleasure of uh, seeing you uh, in person and talking to you in person in the very near future. Once again, Filippo, thank you. Thank you very much, Pader. Thank you very much for all the support and the good ideas.